Hey everybody, it's the Waiting for Next Year.com podcast. Uh, you might or might not remember me. I'm Craig Lindell. On the other end of the line is Jeff Nomina. How's it going, Jeff? Not bad. It's been a while, and you know, luckily, not much has happened in Cleveland sports. So I know, and, we'll, and we'll get th- we'll get there. But we're we were uh, we were talking about vitamins ahead of time, and uh, I was telling you that uh, on the advice of somebody who claims they haven't gotten sick in like four years, probably exaggerating, but. I started taking, because I already t- I already take a lot of s- supplements because like I you know I run a lot and I'm trying to keep my joints healthy or whatever else so I take a vitamin B, D as in dog, C as in cat. I take glucosamine, fish oil, krill oil, and a calcium supplement. And so like it's my uh, my cabinet at home looks absolutely ridiculous. It sounds like you should be putting those all in like a brew, like a witch's brew, and standing there with like a big wood spoon and like some some frog legs and and like other creepy ingredients that you'd be putting in and stirring and cackling as there's like a, a creepy smoke coming off of it. Uh, the, um, does, does each one of those do something specific, or are they all just kind of general health things? The, well, they're all supposed to do something specific. Um, I knew what they were all supposed to do when I started each one of them. But like in, I can't really remember anymore. To be honest with you, I know vit- Obviously, the vitamin D one is like, hey, you live in a place that you don't get sun like you would somewhere else. So here's your vitamin D. <laughs> um, <laughs> and vitamin C. Everybody knows vitamin C. I read somewhere or heard somebody somebody told me that vitamin C really is is fine for you. It's not bad for you, but that it's mostly just that you can't overdose on it. So everybody prescribes it because they know that you just nothing bad can happen to you. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> that's so I'm, really funny. I, I'm fake news, but that totally sounds like something somebody would do. Well, I'm turning forty this year, so I just figured I'd get a jump on on all this uh, extra pills and whatever else. Now I'm just you know I'm just, I'm fighting I'm fighting being old and i'm trying not to be sick and you know, if it costs me an extra 40 or 50 bucks over the course of the winter to have all those vitamins uh, i'm gonna do it well i've had the black death go through my house so i am you could sell me on anything no matter what ridiculous thing you, you told me you do right now i'd be like yeah that sounds like a good idea i, I should try that if i told you to floss <clears throat> with like <laughs> with uh um you know the like baby wipes. You might you might consider at this point. <laughs> yes, anything. It doesn't matter. It's perfectly fine. L- Lysol to wipe your hands. Although flossing, I feel like is one of those things that I just I, I I need to. I I don't. I've always had like cavities and stuff. You know. I, I think some people just get it quicker, but I I hate flossing. It's like a two minute thing that I just act like it's the end of the world every time I have to do it. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad, and nobody does it as much as they're supposed to. Even, no, because even it's dentists. Awful. Yeah, they lie. There's no question that they're lying to us about that. Oh, so if you wait long enough to do a sports podcast, uh, Cleveland Sports delivers, man. <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple of people who didn't get fired in the last few weeks, I think. Yeah. So since we've la- since we talked, Hugh Jackson, Todd Haley got fired. Ty Lue got fired first. Um. And and the Indians are threatening to trade away their third Cy Young Award winner. So other than that, though, it's been pretty good. Let's start with the Indians, because that's probably the thing I'm actually most fired up about currently, because nothing's happened yet. But, like, I, I, I'm not stupid. I understand the business dynamics of owning the Cleveland Indians. But at a certain point... I think this the this ownership group has failed to choose that one iconic player and say nope we're we're never going to trade this guy we've got to keep this one like even the twins kept what Joe Mauer or or one of one of their guys for the entirety of their career well they tried sort of you know with Hafner and Grady and then those guys went down and it and it tanked everything honestly that was Going back to those teams, if Hafner and Grady don't get hurt and are playing through those contracts, you know we might have those kind of iconic guys that let you do that. But yeah, since then we we definitely have just thrown away everybody, and it doesn't sound like there's any chance that Lindor is going to be 
going to be around. So, I mean, maybe, maybe it's Jose Ramirez and we can keep him for a while. But, yeah, we just have not been able to keep that cornerstone kind of guy, that Joey Votto kind of guy. But at a certain point, like, don't don't you make a decision on Lindor? Like, he, he's always going to be tradable, right? So why not control that asset even if you have to pay him $30 million a year for two years? Right, kind of like the, the Cavs did with Kevin Love, where it was, okay, we might not want to keep this going forever, but it's easier to trade him when you have him under control and can – you know, field offers and, and make it happen when you want to happen rather than having to do it on a deadline. And on top of that, you, when Lindor signs whatever deal he signs next, he's still going to be deep in his prime. Um, and I, you know, you could make the argument Kevin Love is too, but Lindor and Kevin Love are not the same thing. No, not even close. And yeah, you can definitely argue that Kevin Love's coming out of his. So yeah, I, I agree 100%. You can always trade Lindor. Like, there's always going to be a market for that guy. And that big of a superstar. So how do you feel about kind of the, and, and this is all alleged, but I presume the Dolans are running kind of a back channel um, media campaign about attendance and payroll and everything else. What I don't understand is the logic behind trading a Carrasco Kluber kind of guy. It, it kind of makes some sense. I mean, nobody thought this team this year was good enough. Right, I mean, like everybody was upset with the quality of this team. We don't want to run I th- out. I thought they just didn't play well, but go ahead. Oh, I agree. I think they were better than they got cut. But I think during the season, most people were upset. And like at the trade deadline, people were definitely mad they didn't do more. Um, but you don't want to get into a situation where the last two years of Lindor being in Cleveland are a terrible team because Kluber's, you know, thirty-five and Carrasco's thirty-four, or whatever age they would be. And so if your argument is, all right, Bieber and Clevenger and Bauer have, have come up, we've got Carrasco and Kluber, you know, now's the time to, to use some of this pitching surplus to go get some players that can come out and extend. Not, I don't even know if extend is the right word, but, you know, fill out the roster while we still have these couple of superstars on the team. I, I, that's a logic I can honestly understand from where they're coming from. But they don't just, you know, come out and say something like that. They come out and do the pity party about the attendance and all of that. And, I mean, you know me. I'm like the number one Dolan defender in the land. Um, but you can't do that. Like, it's just a terrible idea to come out and tell the fans that. Like, I don't understand. Even if it's somewhat right, even if you had the highest payroll you've ever had and attendance went down, you know, I, I, I understand what they're saying. I'm not even opposed to it. But telling the fan base that and selling off the, t- the older members under that, is just terrible management. Well, yeah, it was like, I, I don't think anybody totally disagreed with what Mark Shapiro said about baseball being kind of a lifestyle sport. You, you show up there a couple of times in the summer, regardless of the quality of the team, because the weather's nice and what, whatever else, but to you, you're not allowed to say that where you de-emphasize winning as a reason to go to a baseball game. Right. They, there's, you, you, they keep saying the quiet part out loud, and I don't understand why, because there's no benefit to them. It, it's, like they, it's like they've never turned on sports radio or read Twitter or done anything and, and realize how negative their reputation is in town. And, it, and it's funny to me, because I, I don't... They're very the owners, defensive. Yeah, and of the owners, they're clearly the ones who have the deepest ties to Northeast Ohio and have the easiest sell as being actual like good people and stuff you know i mean the, like they're very involved with Velasano and many other activities things like that like they wouldn't be hard people to cheer for if they could get out of their own way on some of this stuff i agree um but uh, i i don't know it just we all we all understand kind of where the 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 business of sports is going and how much money is made in media rights and on TV and contracts and everything else. And to, to continue to harp on sports tickets and, and ticket sales, I don't, I don't know. It just seems, it seems like a crazy thing. And there, I don't think Indians fans failed the team this year in a lot of ways. I, I think there were a lot of scheduling things and for all intents and purposes, I thought attendance was kind of up 
other than like the tough scheduling irregularities. And I don't want to get into every little detail, but the fans are never wrong. Like they're just not unless you're going to, unless you're trying to move the team. No. And I think baseball is hard in this market. I've said it on Twitter and, and people can agree or disagree, but we're a city that is very spread out. There's a lot of sprawl with Cleveland. And I think it's very hard on a Tuesday night to get people to come down to a baseball game and to buy season tickets to come down to multiple baseball games. I, I think a large portion of your baseball audience lives 40 minutes away from downtown and it makes it really inaccessible to come down to, to multiple games. And you need people who are coming to multiple games to really drive any sort of attendance numbers. So I, I think we're just a market where we, I don't think we need to blame the fans or we need to blame this or, or I don't think there is a, a kind of boogeyman in this. I think it's just a hard market for baseball to survive. Um, I think the criticism that we fail on some is the Indians make like 40 million a year, I think, in TV rights. Tampa Bay just signed a deal that averages 82 million a year in TV rights. And we should be, you know, we have good ratings. We're a, a legacy team. We've been around forever. Like, we should be having a TV contract at least that large as these other teams. And so that's $40 million every year that a team like Tampa has as just coming in above what we have coming in. And when we're signing these TV contracts, like I think that's an area that we should be looking at is how did they fail so bad on reading the market on what those TV rights would be? And I think we're locked in for quite a while. So this isn't something that's going to get better. And, yeah, they, and, they yeah. signed their deal in uh, 2013. So the Indians are probably locked in until the end of 2023. That's a long time to be at hugely under market value. And, uh, you know, I, in sports, numbers start to get not realistic. But $40 million, add $40 million to what the Indians were doing right now. Yeah. Like that's, 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 a, that's a huge difference. And so I think it's things like that that we maybe don't think about to criticize them as much about. But, you know, they need to find ways to make all the revenue they can. We're finding out that there's a cap on how much they're going to make from ticket sales. I think that's fair to say at this point. Like they're never going to be a top 10 attendance team, even top 15, right? Right. No matter what happens. So they need to be smart about the other ways they're doing revenue. And that TV contract is the number one absolute way to do that and they're so far under market value that it's just going to be hard for them to catch up with that and i think that's a criticism that we don't talk about enough on but EL. they were they were smart to to start their own channel and then sell their own channel um so i mean that that's part of the deal too and and the what do you make of my argument that we just we cannot sit here and have these conversations about the business of baseball because we don't have all the information. Like even though we've got that TV deal and the 10 years and the 40 million, 40 million a year and all this stuff that we know, like the asset value. And I know you can't pay a payroll with asset value, but like every year that they do good things, they're turning this team into a more and more valuable commodity. They, the, the team has gone up $700 million roughly in value since they bought it. Oh, yeah. I, I, part is that there's no way to know, and nobody's ever going to share those numbers, right? And if they did, we would never believe them. You know, that's the thing. As much as we all want them to open the book, if they did, we'll all just say, well, that's accounting. Baseball are doing. And the Hey, Jeff, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So they don't share any of the information. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I was just going to say that, you know, I don't think we spend enough time looking at other markets and saying this is how baseball is run in almost every market that is a similar size of Cleveland. And so like are the ones and 
there's this one easy fix and they would just tell the team we'd be good. It's it pretty clear that parts of similar sides are run in extremely similar ways, and this is just kind of the reality of it. And I don't think there's some magic. If somebody bought the team, I doubt it would get much better or change much at all. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, it's part of the reason that I struggle so much with the way the Indians are run is that, like, they they truly are being run like a typical business. And, I, I mean, you can't – I know that the Clippers are in L.A., but – and I know that the NBA is a different beast. It, it just – these things – we shouldn't have to face business realities to be fans in sports. Like it's not supposed to be part of it. The owners are supposed to be these superhuman wealth machines with no financial realities that the rest of us have to think about. And it bugs me, you know, the, the, it just, it just bugs me that baseball has failed in this way. And more than just blaming the Dolans, I've always tried to give the fair share of blame to the game itself because the Yankees and Red Sox don't get to just play in a vacuum. They have to play the Indians and the Twins and the Tigers and all these other teams. Yeah, and I know I've said it on this podcast, but the fact that local TV revenue isn't shared across the entire league just never really makes sense to me. You can't you can't play games on your local channel without other teams to be playing against, and <clears throat> it doesn't make sense. Those you know that all of that revenue isn't shared. So, but I think to your point, we all love Dan Gilbert because he spent, and and a lot of NBA market going having similar conversations about their NBA owners that we are about the Dolphins. Any sport where just the size of your market or the size of your owner's wealth is a major advantage is just not a fun situation for fans in any way. And that's one thing that the NFL has figured out where we don't really talk about cheap owners or anything like that. There's good owners and bad owners, and that's still not great, but there's less about their wealth being a huge asset because you just can't get around the rules that easily. And I wish the other sports were more like that because it's more fun as a fan to not have to think about that. Like I Thinking about your owner is just not fun. And what's and what's really crazy is you're right, but th- that just came up when, um, when the Raiders traded with the Bears. A lot of the reason, or a lot of the rumored reason, was that the Raiders didn't have enough cash flow to put an escrow for the guaranteed portion of the contract that they were going to have to to give. Um, and so they just they just made a trade. They got rid of like the, one of the very best um, football players in the entire game because they had a cash crunch problem. Yeah, and that's fair, but it, it happens so much more infrequently in the NFL. Or, or no, I know, you know it's the exception. Big example, of one. <clears throat> yeah, and that's a big example, and it, it happens on smaller scale. You know, I'm sure the Haslam's weren't just trying to save up assets and things like that when they weren't spending, you know, the last couple of years. I'm sure that there were some fun, you know, benefits to that for them, but it still makes sense in a football world. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's just, I don't know that I've barely, I, yeah, I've been, a, I've been more <laughs> of a fair weather fan with the Indians since they traded CC, then Cliff Lee, then Victor Martinez and, I don't even feel like I've been all in the same way. Maybe it's just because I'm older, but if they trade another Cy Young award winner, no matter how many, well, actually people try and tell me it makes sense. Like the most decorated player pitcher in the history of the franchise, who's still on a reasonable deal. Like at a certain point, it just doesn't, it's not logical. Oh, no, I get it. And the only way it makes sense is if they get so much back in return that it instantly makes them the team that we thought that we were going to see this year, right? If they trade Kluber and come out the next year in 100 games and make it to the World Series, we're, we're not that upset about them anymore. Those trades all were terrible because they signaled to ever be. So that matters. If, if these trades are just to, if they Kluber to start a rebuild, we should charge him pitchforks. If they trade him and do so in a way that somehow extend this win of all that they have some of these superstars, then I think it'll be easier to survive. 
Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not saying it would be fun. And it's interesting that Carrasco is a really, really good pitcher. Like, he, he's not that far off from Kluber. And if they traded him, I don't feel like people would be that upset. No. So if they if they traded Bauer, if they traded Encarnacion, if they traded uh, even Carrasco, although I think they should keep Carrasco, um, I, I think the, the fan base would understand. But there's a certain amount of pride that we have in Corey Kluber being here because of what he's done and the Cy Young Awards and, like... I, I know that those Cy Young Awards in the past don't do anything on a going forward basis, but there's something to be said for the signaling, the PR of of having traded two Cy Young Award winners already. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's why I wonder if they look at someone like a Carrasco as a trade. Uh, they too young, but ready you know an outfit really good sighting i think uh i just uh i think maybe it's not our night man the the connection's bad again well we're back let's see how this goes it sounds good now it's strange all right i'll try to sit with my face pressed against my router here the the other fun part is that now i'm going to have a hell of a time editing it's gonna be a lot of fun <laughs> Um, all right, so let's let's talk about the Browns. They fire everybody, and uh, they get themselves into coach search mode. Um, I I think most people know you're kind of Dolphins first, but you pay attention because you're here and and you live on Twitter with all these people, all these Browns fans. So what did you make of of everything that went down? Were you kind of surprised that it happened when it did and and the way it did? Yeah, I was shocked that they got rid of Haley, and I thought that was like one of the a, a really smart, good move because there was clearly a power play going on with him and Hugh, with him, and to show everyone involved that that isn't how this is going to work, <laughs> and that you weren't going to be rewarded for that, and I, I just thought that made a lot of sense. Like if you promoted Haley from that, everybody knew what was going on with him and Hugh, and this made sure that everyone understood that that's not how this organization is going to work moving forward. Yeah. It's kind of surprising. I, I thought it was the right thing to, um, and it's, it's funny cause I was one of the last ones that kind of defended Hugh and there, there's been a lot of kind of rewriting history now saying, well, they should have just fired Hugh at the end of the Owen 16 season. And I, I guess I understand that, but the timing of it where, the season ends and then you get yourself into free agency and draft mode. Like the team that, that they would have been doing a coach search with uh, a, a new coach having Tyrod Taylor and having no idea what was going to happen in the draft. And so it limits, it limits your ability to attract good candidates. I, I actually think, even if it was by accident that they this was the best possible outcome for them that uh Hugh Jackson coached the majority of the season or the first half of the season and uh and now they get to search for the coach because now it's actually an attractive job where I don't think it was when they would have had to make the move last time yeah i agree and i think you know Hugh's been around the league he's he was a respected candidate when he came in. I know people forget that now, but like he was a big hire. <laughs> like that was a that was an exciting thing. You remember? Like he was a big get. And to give him those rosters and then fire him, I don't think was gonna go over well in the coaching community, which is, you know, notoriously tight knit and a buddy system kind of thing. So I, I think that giving him a shot with a legit roster, watching them fail, gave them the out they needed to say, Listen, we didn't sign this guy up for this and then can him when he couldn't win with Kevin Hogan. So yeah, I think in that regard too, it, it bought them a little bit of leeway there. Yeah. And, and now it, it buys everybody time. Uh, the, the, the running backs coach becomes the offensive coordinator. Greg Williams gets to put on the Greg Williams show and he's immune. Like he, he is out of F's to give 
in the universe. And he, I, he talks himself into a corner during, uh, during media availability and he won't even walk it back later. It's, it's kind of funny. He's like the most football guy to ever football guy. <laughs> like it's mind like that comment. What was I, I had 11 <clears throat> job offers and four of them didn't even want interviews or something like that. Like that's clearly not true. Like it's almost half the league. <laughs> like, come on, man. It's, that's like the football guy version of like, I'm here to kick ass and chew bubble gum and I'm all out of bubble gum. <laughs> right. It's just hilarious. It's just a uh, line yeah, not... that he's been saying for years and he now believes it. Yes, exactly. I'm not a big Greg Williams fan, the whole bounty gate thing and all that, but yeah, it, he can clearly do the job. He's been around long enough to, to run the team. There's no threat of him being kept long-term. Uh, this offensive coordinator sounds, seems interesting enough in that, Haley gets caught up being Todd Haley sometimes. And, you know, I think this guy will will make things a little bit more simple and not try to be the show and let Baker kind of be the show and stuff. So I I think it'll be good for the team overall. Um, But it's definitely, I'm shocked that they got rid of both guys. I think that was a really gutsy move and a good move. Yes. And I I think it, it really leads them down the path to finally put in a structure and I I know there are some at waiting for next year who don't like this structure, but to, to elevate Elliot Wolf to GM, make Dorsey kind of that president and, and have all things reporting to John Dorsey, because I don't think I was very happy when they did that structurally with Joe Banner, but I didn't trust Joe Banner. Um, I trust John Dorsey to I really truly think I think he's the whole the way Holmgren should have been because he's he'll actually put in the time and show up and and do the work whereas Holmgren was like semi retired when he was in that job and and in fairness to Holmgren something that I think he takes a the the whole laziness thing he was basically being the owner in instead of randy lerner so he was going to like owners meetings he's doing this he's doing that um he wasn't just your typical team president he was basically your owner for your absentee owner and a lot of the dorsey criticisms in the past have been uh kind of his attention to detail or you know some of the contracts he's given out some of that stuff and i think if you put him in elevate him to a role where he's more high level thinker you know setting a tone setting the relationships it it probably serves him better than being the guy who's writing his name on the contracts. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, self-awareness is, is a real big thing in every organization, especially, you know, big time management type positions. And if, if being super duper organized is not John Dorsey's thing and, and you could see it, I hate to go back to hard knocks and use it as like, well, this is evidence of, of X and Y, but when when they start throwing a bunch of stats at Dorsey, you could tell he's just like he didn't he didn't know where they were going with it. You know, he's more of a high level guy. Um, he didn't realize they were talking about Des Bryant, I think is what it was, um, even though Des Bryant was the person who was coming in to visit. Or he, he should have known. But it's like, does it really matter No, I guess not, I, uh, especially if you've got ultra qualified people like Elliot Wolf and Alonzo Highsmith in your front office. Yeah, exactly. Let that's a skill, right? Like being the high level thinker, being the guy who sets the tone and, and organizes the people and the uh, what's going on there is a skill and being the guy who organizes the the details and the stats and the contracts is a skill and he doesn't have to be good at both. If he's good at one, elevate him to that role and keep him in that role. You know, play people to their strengths and he seems to have a strength there. So I I it seems like <laughs> Dorsey is a guy who's setting that culture a bit, and it seems like the Haslam's have figured out either to listen to him or to yeah. And I'm going back to the Haley and Hugh both being fired. That they're they're figuring out that it's not just playing favorites and playing politics and all of that, and and how to kind of be smart about what they're doing. So it seems like the organization is getting a little bit of footing um, after you know a couple of years of not so much and, and learning some lessons. So whether that's all Dorsey or whether the Haslam's are l- learning as well, it seems to be getting better. 
Well, and and we we did hear today that uh, the Haslam's will let John Dorsey run the coaching search. I don't I don't know if this means he's going to become president or whatever, but the idea that I mean obviously the Haslam's are going to meet all the candidates or or the finalists and have some input, but good of them to not pretend like they they've had they've had a few chances and they're not good at this whole thing. <laughs> Exactly. Right. I mean, even just even if he's just a buffer, even if he only lets like the two or three good candidates actually get to them, that's a huge win. Right. Yeah. Well, and they they do need to have, be able to have some kind of a working relationship with the coach, whoever it is. So they, they better not despise whoever it is that John Dorsey wants to bring in. And they do need to be involved. Like, I'm not one of these people who is going the Haslam shouldn't do anything. They shouldn't have any input whatsoever. Like I'm not, that's unrealistic and silly, but, um, they, they, they should have their roles very well defined and limited. And sometimes you know, there, things like hiring Hugh Jackson. I don't know that the Haslam should have known that that was going to be a bad idea. He was, we talked about earlier, super you know, well-respected. He was one of the top candidates that year. They were and, still lucky to get him. Right. And I don't know that, if they should have are... known that Sashi Brown was a bad idea. <laughs> Fair. But if, if you're the Haslams, are you supposed to know from one interview with Hugh Jackson that he's terrible, like, you know, as opposed to his entire reputation and experience in the league? Like, I, they're not football people. They don't necessarily know those things. So I think in sports we struggle with, you know, process over results sometimes. And was hiring Hugh Jackson a mistake? Yeah. Did you know that at the time? No, it seemed like a slam dunk at the time. Yeah, kind of like those extensions for Grady Sizemore and Travis Hafner. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, all right, so last last but not least, you were saying we need to get back on the podcast train because you're completely off the rails, full-blown uh, Twitter alcoholic. I am just on so much, especially with uh, you know Ty Lue getting fired. And all the kind of drama with the Cavs that happened the last couple of weeks, and then midterms hitting, it was just it was too much. It was it was too much going on. Oh for me yeah, to stay on. election election Twitter. And I was talking to somebody today. No matter how many times I go through it, I still always sit there and watch live events through Twitter, and it's just the worst way because like ninety percent of the stuff you get in real time is wrong or bad, and the filters that you know, like Twitter has somewhat of a filter where. Something makes it to your timeline. It's probably been retweeted enough that somebody saw it and knew that it was a respected person and put it on your timeline. You know, like I feel like my my timeline is clean enough that if it makes it on there, it's fairly respectable. But in those like kind of in the moment, yeah. it does not happen. Anything can come through, and I really remember that again watching the elections last night through Twitter. Yeah, it's it's just a we're using it all wrong, and it's a, it's a bad place to hang out. I found myself with. Brown season. I don't really talk politics, but with Brown season that I'm on there too much. Uh, I had a very healthy relationship with, with it when I first came back where I was kind of talking and conversing and putting it down. And then, you know, with, with the events of the last three or four weeks and all the firings and everything else, I found myself refreshing a lot. And all of a sudden I'm very much interested in, a bunch of other people's opinions that I shouldn't be. I should just, I should just let it go. So I think you and I are kind of on the same page on the Hugh stuff where I totally agree. He should have been fired, but I, I think we made maybe a bigger deal or a scapegoat out of him in ways that were a little bit too far. Or he wasn't dealt a hand that was overly, you know, <laughs> able to be played. Um, and I found myself sitting there arguing about Hugh Jackson all day. And I'm like, what? why do I care about this? This guy's fired. I don't have to think about him anymore. And so I actually muted the word Hugh. And it, like, stopped that immediately. Like, that was sucking up, like, two or three days of just bad Twitter behavior. And as soon as I muted it, I was right back to, like, being a healthy Twitter user again. So are you an iPhone guy? Yeah. So ha how has their screen time update affected you? Oh man. Do you feel I, bad? Does it make you feel bad about yourself or rethink your usage at all? Yeah, it does. Although when it goes down at all, if I have 1% less usage, I feel like I ran a marathon. Like, <laughs> like it, it's like I went on a diet and lost 15 pounds. Cause I cut down on five minutes of screen time per day. Oh, that's funny. 
I wish I could look it up right now, but I, I'm on a lot. I didn't know but I also, you know, I'm sure like you listen to podcasts and music and stuff too, which drives it up a little bit. Yeah, it does a little bit, but, um, <laughs> to give me this, don't, don't take this away from me. Don't, don't tell me it doesn't drive it up. I really don't. I don't think, I think cause I turn a podcast on, then I turn the screen off. I don't think that, I don't think that counts against me. Oh man. <laughs> I've, got, I've got some work to do. <laughs> I won't even ask you how many hours a day because I don't think you want to reveal. No, it's bad. I got to get better. But right. I've been healthier about it lately, and that's good. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll you know, Joe Rogan and his buddies do sober October. We're gonna have to do. We're gonna have to do a month a year without Twitter. That's actually a really good idea. It's too bad none of the none of the months start with T, so we can't get any. Uh, good alliteration going i know everything's better with alliteration would you ever do a sober october or a sober month with no alcohol yeah oh man i don't drink heavily ever but i have like one drink a day and it i I need that drink at the end of the day i don't know see that's a healthy relationship that's how i should use twitter (laughs) (laughs) like all right the kids are in bed I can log on for a half hour now and enjoy myself and then set it down and be done. That's how, that's my, that's how I treat alcohol. Kids are in bed. One beer. That was good. Done. That is a very healthy relationship with beer, actually. Yeah, just actually enjoying it. Not, not doing it for a purpose of anything. Oh. That's, what, that's what I need to get to with Twitter. I don't think you can. <laughs> I can't. I'm not even, even going to pretend like I have any sort of strength for that. Oh, it's going to be so fun when, when everybody has to quit. Cause they're like, Oh yeah, this is killing people. Like, <laughs> like the, 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 you're going to realize like it's taking years off your life, like smoking. Oh, it absolutely is. Right. Like there has to be some studies in the very near future about how unhealthy this all is. Like the stress that's involved with it. It makes me care about things that I shouldn't care about at all. Oh yeah. I'll have the dumbest arguments about stuff I don't care about. And I'm just like, you know, you're like mad when you're like holding your phone, like waiting for that response and you're mad and somebody's talking to you in real life and you're like not even paying attention because you're just waiting for that response. It's so pathetic. Yeah. I've been, I've still been better about like, I don't put the world on hold so I can tell somebody on the internet that they're wrong. But it's, I mean, I still, I, it's impacting my mental state sometimes. And that's when I really need to just turn the damn thing off. And it would be easier if our sports teams weren't so disastrous all the time. Yeah, they're really bad right now. Like I found like with the Dolphins, and I follow them quite a bit. I never am online arguing about them because they're just like mediocre and fine. And there's just not that much to get worked up about. But like when your teams are going through these major overhauls all the time, there's these huge decisions being made. And your coaches are being fired. And how should you do this? And who should replace them? And you know, everybody gets dug in on should have they been fired, whereas... And losing three out of four play, uh, overtime games. <laughs> yes. And so, like, when your team's mediocre, you're just kind of like, okay, that's fine. You know, we won this one, we're going to lose the next one. There's just not that much to get that round up. But. Eh, my quarterback's Ryan Tannehill. Right. He's hurt. We have Brock Weil- Osweiler. It's great. Ross Wild. It's so much fun. Who cares? <laughs> Honestly, quarterback being hurt is the best way to watch football because there's just no stakes. Nothing matters at all. Like those final games of the season where Bruce Gradkowski is playing against the Steelers. Yeah, and you're just like, well, this this doesn't matter. I don't have to care about this guy at all. I don't have to care about these wins at all. Oh, hey, it's let's see what Thaddeus Lewis can do. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's a couple of young players that, like, if they're good, it's exciting. But if they're bad, you can just say they're young players and it doesn't matter. Like, that's that's the dream right there. Yeah, and we had what the Thad Lewis, the the youngish um, Ivy League quarterback, or whatever. it's like it's just perfect. It's a perfect way to end a bad season. Yes, exactly. Low no stress, low stress. <laughs> Although last year, you know, the Browns with their zero and sixteen bid against the Steelers backups couldn't pull it off. Yeah, yeah, that, that's bad. You know, my my whole thesis is be bad or be entertaining, though. Yeah, I mean, be good or be entertaining, and <clears throat> at least at least that was entertainment. You know, watching them there they're in over sixteen gave some sort of rooting interest. But the Browns are always entertaining, so you guys don't have to worry about that quite so much. All right. Well, is there anything else we need to uh, to hit on, or uh, maybe I'll talk to you in three weeks. 
<laughs> nah, we can talk Cavs next week. I don't, right. I don't, I'm, I'm still too new. It's still the wound is still too open for me. And I don't feel like we know anything. You know, Kevin Love's hurt, and uh, they fired Ty Lu, and I I don't know. It just it feels like the story's half told right now. There there's I don't I don't have a conclusion. I don't have any hot takes about the Cavs right now. I just don't. Yeah, and like Colin Sexton's the eighth pick in the NBA draft, which is never really that great, and he hasn't looked that great. So there's just nothing this season that matters enough to get that worked up about. No, not yet. Not yet. All right, we have plenty of time to talk Cavs. And honestly, I expect a couple of trades or buyouts or both. So, Oh, yeah, for sure. This team this team is going to look vastly different by the end of the year. Very similar to uh, years with LeBron James. The team was never the same, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. It's, it's amazing how LeBron's gone, but it feels the exact same. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have time to talk about LeBron as well. Because things aren't exactly going swimmingly over there either. No, and I'm doing my best not to enjoy it, but <laughs> <laughs> damn it, damn it if I'm not. <laughs> and I bet you're tweeting about it. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, well, that's that's good. Um, that's a good place to stop. I'll talk to you next time. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. It's been the waitingfornextyear.com podcast.